Bonnie Blair. I love that Charles Perrault tape, and I know that you do as well. And the, the thing I love about it is just love to skate. So, Bonnie, here's a group of people that just love to extend and improve life for hundreds of thousands of people around the world. And they love to win. I've gotten that feeling this morning, watching backstage and what you guys have been doing. Um, it is nice for me to be here and maybe share some of the things that I went through and I hope you can see how maybe some of them hopefully can help you to stay on top like you already are. Light us up. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Gosh, I almost felt like I was on that top podium again. You guys uh, have a lot of energy out there and I appreciate that. Um, it is nice for me to be here with you this morning and share some things of what I went through. I think probably one of the most asked questions of me is when I go different places is, what does it feel like to win an Olympic gold medal? And that is a loaded question. But I guess I, I have found the easiest way to answer that is kind of going back in time like Charles Corral did. Uh, because when I go back to the first Olympic Games where I won an Olympic gold medal in Calgary, uh, my family had all been in one area to watch the event itself. Uh, but for the award ceremonies, they wanted to be right front and center, and that's not where their seats were. So, uh, you know, when they, they kind of moved about and they were trying to get right front and center, but they were scattered throughout the, the stands. And I can remember just as I was about to get up onto the podium to receive my gold medal, I could remember looking out in the audience and I found my sister Angela, and she was crying. And over on the other side, I found my sister Susie. Big, huge grin on her face. Uh, my sister Mary, now she's the loud and boisterous one. She was yelling, screaming, carrying on, going absolutely nuts. Uh, my brother Rob high-fiving somebody. And then my mom looking scared to death as if I was still racing. Well, that was a special moment for me because to be able to look out into the audience, see my family, see all those different emotions, I can safely say that that's exactly what it felt like to win an Olympic gold medal. And then I was lucky enough to do that five different times at three different Olympic Games. Um, there's nothing quite like it. I'm glad for videos where I can kind of relive it all over again. Um, it was truly very special moments for me, something that I was very proud of, but so exciting to do. In my last Olympic Games, where I was able to capture my fourth and fifth Olympic gold medal, a lot of people would probably say, well, those were your best events at that Olympic Games in Lillehammer. But actually, my best event came in the 1500 meters. And in that event, I placed fourth. And I just missed winning a bronze medal by three one hundredths of a second. So I can remember going back to uh, the media room and having all these guys throw microphones in front of my face saying, Oh, you must be so disappointed. And well, maybe part of me was disappointed, but another part of me felt on top of the world. And the reason being, in that race, in that 1500 meters, I skated that race faster than I ever had in my entire life. It was a personal best for me. I skated almost a half a second faster than I'd ever skated before. Now, not only was it a personal best for me in the 1500 meters, it was actually the first personal best I had achieved in any race since the Olympics were in Calgary back in 1988. This was now 1994. So I was. I was on top of the world. Yes, I'm not lying. I would have been higher up there had I received that bronze medal that I just narrowly missed. I'm not going to lie to you. But, you know, I couldn't be disappointed with what I had done. I had had a goal in front of me. I had surpassed that goal, and to me, that was something to be proud of. Setting a personal best, doing something that I that I had never done before, doing it better than I had ever done before. 
personal best. That's what I think it's really all about. So what's the measure that we set for ourselves? Now listening, listening here this morning and hearing what may be your personal best, being number one in tacky, vaulting to that number two in Brady, those are going to be your measures that you set for yourself to try to be the best that you can be. I come from what I think was a pretty amazing sport. Uh, but one of the things that I loved about the sport was that clock at the end of the straightaway. Focusing on that clock, that was my ultimate competitor. You know, we didn't have any judges awarding points. There was nothing left up to opinion and no other guy to blame. That clock told it all. That's how I was able to measure what I was doing, measure my performance, try to measure my personal best. Now, through the different successes that I had through the sport of speed skating, I felt that there were three specific essentials that really helped me to get there. Now, you're having your 30th year anniversary. You've been successful. How do you keep that going? How do you get to be better than you've ever been? Well, hopefully, through a couple of these things, maybe that will help you. These were the things that helped me. Being dedicated, having a sense of balance in my life, and being willing to take a risk. Now, dedication, as you saw on the Charles Kuralt video, I was on skates at the age of two. I was racing at the age of four. Now, is that where the true dedication started? No, I don't think so. But for the most part, what I remember is like Charles Perrault said, I love to skate. I loved what I did. And I had a passion for it. And that is a very big part of dedication. Seeing the, the things that you're going through, watching your videos today, you have a passion for what you do. You look like you have so much fun when you come to work every day. I mean, I know all those videos aren't what you do every day, but, um, but you enjoy what you're doing. And that's huge. Because the thing is, is every day isn't going to be hearing the national anthem, receiving awards, getting flowers, all those kind of things. You're going to have your frustrations along the way. Believe me, I had many frustrations. Not just days. You know, sometimes I'd have an entire year of a frustration. But through it all, I never lost the love for what I was doing. That love that you have, that passion that you have, is going to be the key thing that helps you when things go wrong. When things aren't going correct, that passion is what's going to bring you back day to day to try to get back to maybe what you once were, to try to surpass what you've ever done before, to help you through those bad times. Because every day is not going to be perfect we will have those little glitches along the way. But that love is a very big part of what's going to help you through all that. The love that you have, you know, hearing Fred saying, you know, how many people's lives that you touch? That's passion right there. I think I saw a quote that says, um, you know, every day, um, you know, every year, every lifetime. You're treating people, helping people, making their lives better. That's something that's going to put a smile on your face every day. That's something that's very special. That's being dedicated to what you do. Now, when I was uh, about 12, I can remember I went and visited my dad at his office. Now, uh, the reason I probably did it was because his office wasn't far from where I went to school, so I think I was probably just bumming a ride home. But uh, he introduced me to a new co-worker of his. And my dad was a man of very few words. Uh, you know, I can remember times I lived in Champaign, Illinois. We'd go up to Chicago on weekends. Sometimes he'd barely say two words the whole way up and back in the car. He was a man of very few words. But that day when he introduced me to a new co-worker of his, he said, this is my daughter, Bonnie. She's going to be in the Olympics, and she's going to win an Olympic medal. Well, I thought, is he nuts or what? And then I think, okay, I'm a little kid. You know how parents embarrass you. Maybe that's what it is. I'm not really sure. 
but I remembered that statement. And after I won my first Olympic gold medal, one of my competitors from what was then the former East Germany came up to me and said, that was not a race, that was a dream. And maybe in a certain sense it was. Because was it my dad's dream that I go on and become what I became? But whatever it was, he planted that seed in my head. And then I was able to turn around and make that reality. You have many dreams in your mind of where you want to go and what you want to become. You can never dream too big. Because you can take those dreams. You can make them become a reality. Goals, I think, are also a very important part of that whole dedication process. And I've heard you talk uh, a lot this morning about the different goals. Obviously, a lot of my goals relied on that clock at the end of the straightaway. Seconds, tenths of a second, and even hundredths of a second. So I told you about that bronze medal that I lost by three one-hundredths of a second, but I also won two Olympic gold medals by two one-hundredths of a second. That's about that far and takes about that long. See, I'll give up that bronze to make sure I keep those other two gold ones. <laughs> I'm no dummy. <laughs> the clock at the end of the straightaway, that was something that I could focus on. That was my ultimate competitor. That helped me in my goals in my racing. But I also had goals every day, whether it would be in training. For instance, one of the goals that we did, or that I had, um, we would train together as a team. Men, women, sprinters, distance skaters. And one of the workouts we did was a workout that we called hill loops. It was done in the Milwaukee area by our lakefront. And what it is is kind of running through these trails, but up a hill on one side, a flat part on the top, down the other side, and a flat part on the bottom. Now, I would roughly have, uh, or e each loop would roughly take me about four minutes. Obviously, the guys on our team can run those a little faster. I would normally have 10 loops to run. The men sprinters would normally have 12 loops to run. And the distance guys were going so far, I don't even want to think about it. I'm a sprinter. So, my goal for that workout was to make sure I finished my 10th loop before the guys started on their 12th. I didn't want them to catch me. I didn't want them to lap me. And the thing was, is I'd find myself sprinting up that last hill so that they wouldn't catch me. Well, this was one of the workouts where the guys could kind of use the girls because they're thinking, you know, hey, Bonnie's still in front of us. We've got to try to catch her. Well, the only reason I am in front of them is because I'm really so far behind them. But see, it doesn't matter. You just have to figure out how you can have these little goals to help you get through the day. Get through that next workout. Get through that next program. Whatever it is that you're working on. Those little goals are the, help us, are the things that help us to get to that next level, which is where you want to go. Having goals every single day of our life. I didn't go into speed skating to go into public speaking. So believe me, I need my goals today too. <laughs> we need goals every single day of our life. Now also our performance. It can depend on so many different factors. But only some of those factors we can actually control. What I can control is my mind what I would mentally bring to the starting line. You know, I know everybody else can do all the same work that I could do, but you've got to be in that right frame of mind on that given day to make it all happen, to maybe make those dreams become the reality. Having that vision, knowing where you want to go and what steps you need to take in order to get there. I think another part of dedication, at least for me, was competition. I can remember going to uh, various international competitions and just stepping on the ice and training with some of my biggest competitors gave me this urge that says, yeah, I want to go out and I want to get them. 
Well, I think you're pretty lucky to be able to be in the same area where your competitors are. That's going to keep you on that edge all that time. Keep you striving to be better than you are, knowing that your competitors are just right down the road. To me, being with those biggest competitors was the thing that always helped me to skate better. You're right with your competitors. That's going to keep you on your toes, toes, keep you on the edge of your seat, and keep you performing at your absolute best. Because you can't slack. You can't let back. You've always got to be ready to take that one more step. The next part I want to share with you is balance. Now, in the balance I really believe comes from a lot of different areas. The biggest and strongest balance in my area came from my family and what the media wound up dubbing the Blair Bunch. Now, my first Olympic Games was in Sarajevo, Yugoslavia in 1984 that had three members, my mom and my two sisters. We went on to Calgary. I told you about some of them. There were 25 people there for that Olympic Games. That was the closest Olympics. Uh, as far as in distance goes. Then we went on to Albertville, France. Now that number grew to 45. But I'm not done yet because I still had one more Olympic Games and that was in Lillehammer and there were 60 people there to watch me race. They traveled all that way. They paid all their own expenses to watch me compete in three different races that totaled less than six minutes. Now, I'm glad I didn't think about that as I went to the starting line. <laughs> but, you know, the thing was is I knew that they'd be there for me whether I won, whether I lost, whether I couldn't even compete that day because that's how my family's always been. We're always there for each other every step of the way, supporting each other. You know, yeah, my parents might have had me on skates at the age of two and racing at the age of four. It could have been my older brothers and sisters. I'm not sure which. But I never felt forced into it. It came from within. It was because I wanted to do it. Giving the support that each of us needed to do whatever we wanted to do in our lives. Creating that balance to make that success possible. Now also it came from my teammates. You know, for instance, Dan Jansen was on every single Olympic team that I was on dating back to 1984. And he was fourth in those Olympic Games. Just nearly missed a bronze medal in Sarajevo. We know what happened in 1988 where he fell on the day that his sister died. A few days later he fell again. Albert Bill, the ice was soft. He's a much bigger guy. He didn't really adjust his technique for it. Finished all the medals there. Go to Lily Hummer, he slips in the first 500. Now in his last Olympic race of his career is on the line. Seeing him win that 1,000 meter race in world record time was one of the greatest moments at those Olympic Games. And I came away with two gold medals. That was a very special moment for me. To be able to see my teammate, one of my best friends, do something that I know had eluded him for years. Then to think, maybe did I have a little part in that? I'd like to think so. Did I help him run up that hill a little bit faster? I'd like to think so. To be able to share in the pride of somebody else's success sometimes is almost as sweet as tasting it yourself. Having your best friend there with you, picking up the pieces when things go wrong, and patting them on the back when things go right. For me, a coach that was maybe there to help me first taste that little bit of success, that says that one thing that makes that light go on that says, yeah, I've got it. For you, maybe it's that mentor that you've had in your life that's helped you to get to where you are. A teammate, maybe that's a coworker that you work alongside and seeing them and their successes. That is what I call balance, creating that balance that makes that success possible. You are, yes, a company, yet you're all individuals trying to do your best. You do your best as an individual 
then your immediate group does their best, whether it's in management, whether it's in sales, whether it's in the technical part. And then as a company, you're successful. And that's how you're going to be able to get those bonuses that I'm hearing about. So you're all successful individually. You turn that into success as a team, as a company. That's what balance is all about. Relying on each other, counting on each other, helping each other, everybody trying to perform their best. Now my last part is risk. And for sure as an athlete, if I wasn't willing to take a risk, I knew one of my other competitors were. Well, going into what was my last Olympic Games in Lillehammer, I took what a lot of people considered to be a very big risk, and I changed coaches. So here, after winning three Olympic gold medals and a bronze, I did what a lot of people thought was absolutely crazy. But remember I told you I skate against that clock at the end of the straightaway. And that clock was not reading numbers that I liked the year before the Olympic Games. So, and I was actually still finishing in the top three. But I felt I could be better than that. I need to make a change. I need to do something different. So I changed coaches. And now with my new coach, who actually was with me as a competitor in 84, 88, 92, he had retired and gone into coaching, we were going to change things quite a bit. We were going to focus more on the quality of our work instead of the quantity. You know, I think we always thought in the eyes of American speed skating, more was better. More laps, more weights, more bike rides. But that wasn't working. We had to change things, had to do something different. I was also going to focus a little bit more on my technique. Now, my technique had been always one of my strong points. But for some reason, we kind of lost track of that. So maybe in a sense, it was like going back to the basics. But those basics were some of the things that gave me the success in the very beginning. Yes, maybe it was taking a step backwards, but I wound up taking a big, huge step forward. Because now I was skating times I hadn't skated in nearly six years. You know, maybe that was a risk. But also in my heart, I knew what I was doing was the correct thing. You were talking earlier today about believing. I believed I was making that right decision. And when you believe in what you're doing, you go out there, you give it everything you've got, and then you strive once again for that personal best. The last thing I'm going to share with you this morning is also another story about a risk. And it happened indirectly right after the Olympic Games were in Lillehammer in 1994. Now, the Olympic Games happened, and they happened in February, but our season goes on a little bit longer. We have World Cups, uh, we have World Championships, and then there's also kind of a fun meet, but an intense meet that I call at the end of the season. They have it every year. It's in Calgary. They still have it. They get skaters from all over. They get skaters from all ages probably almost as young as four, maybe not quite. I know that last year there was a guy there skating in his 60s. This competition is designed for athletes to go and achieve their personal best. It doesn't matter what your level of skating is. So when I was in Lillehammer, yes, I set a track record in the 500 meters, and that was actually the second fastest 500 meters I had ever skated. I still had the world record, which I had set in Calgary in 1988 of a time of 39.10 seconds. In Lillehammer, I skated a time of 39.25 seconds. Like I said, that was my second fastest time. But a month, after, a month and a half after the Olympic Games, there was this competition in Calgary. And I was so close in Lillehammer to achieving that personal best. So I was going to keep going. And I remember about a week after the Olympic Games, I get a call from my mom, and I'm in this little town in Germany where nothing really happens except speed skating. 
And she says, everybody back here wants to know where you are. Why aren't you coming home, reaping the awards of being another Olympic champion, having parades and parties and everything? And my mom knew what I was doing. She knew I wanted to go to Calgary. She knew I wanted to finish the rest of the World Cup season. But she was sharing with me what kind of everybody back in the sort of Midwest was thinking. And I think a lot of people remember my mom because for some reason she'd get more airtime during the Olympics than I would. <laughs> now you have to remember my race is like 39 seconds, so they show her before my race, during my race, after my race. She did get more airtime than I did. Um, so anyway, so a month and a half goes by, I go to Calgary, I skate my first 500 meters, now I've skated my second fastest time ever. This is a time of 39.19 seconds. Still not quite that world record that I was shooting for. Now I guess I kind of relate it to um, Roger Bannister. Remember when he was the first one to break that four minute mile? It represented an ultimate barrier. Now, my ultimate barrier wasn't just 39.10 seconds. I wanted to be the first female to skate a 38-second 500. That was my ultimate barrier. So, like I said, the first 500 goes, it was a little bit faster. I've got one more shot at the end of the season. There weren't going to be any more competition. Now, you have to remember, this isn't the Olympic Games. This is a little competition in Calgary where maybe there was like 200 people in the stands. That included the competitors and maybe their parents. It wasn't even this many people. So my last race, the gun goes off, the first 100 meters, the exact same time that I had skated in Lillehammer, so I knew I was on a good race. Down the back stretch, around the last turn, down that final home stretch, cross the finish line, look at the clock, 38 .99 seconds. Just barely. But you know, seeing those numbers on that clock could not have compared to any welcome home party, any welcome home parade. That was something that I had been striving for for over six years. That was my ultimate barrier. And to see those numbers is something I'll never forget. Like I said, it was a month and a half after the Olympics. I now go home to what is my hometown in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. They had a big welcome home party for me. The week after that, I went down to Champaign, Illinois, which was where I grew up and at the time where my mom still lived. Big, huge welcome home party for me. Uh, the 4th of July, I was the Grand Marshal in the parade in Champaign. And then I was also co-grand marshal with Mario Andretti at the Indianapolis 500 parade. See, I had all that. They waited for me. <laughs> but the thing was, is I was able to go out and do what I loved first and foremost. And that was to skate, and that was to achieve a personal best. Sharing some of these things that I did here with you this morning are things that I will help, I hope will help you vault you to that next level, take you further than you've ever thought of going before, taking those dreams that you have, making them become a reality. You know, yes, maybe you've achieved a personal best, and maybe you'll achieve another personal best here in 2003, but I think the thing what you want to do is you don't only want to achieve a personal best, you want to beat your competitors, but in the long run, you want to set a world record. You want to see those numbers on that clock, those numbers in your area, or however you envision being successful. You want to see those numbers say the things that you want it to say. You want to see that world record. That's how you're going to be able to be successful. First beating yourself, then beating everybody else, in the long run setting a world record. But you do that by achieving those personal bests along the way. Maybe every day, maybe every couple of months. I hope the things that I shared with you this morning are going to help you to get there. To get to that next level. By being dedicated, 
having that sense of balance in your life, being willing to take a risk. You're taking risks all the time. You're constantly making new products. That's risking. Those are the things that are keeping you ahead of everybody else. But you've got to keep doing it to stay ahead of everybody else. The things I shared with you here this morning are the things that helped me gain my success. By winning five Olympic gold medals and a bronze for myself, my family, but for my country. It's something very proud of and something that I was very happy to be able to share here with you this morning. I thank you and wish you all the success in 2003. Thank you. So much. Bonnie, I'd like to uh, pick up on part of that story and say the following. Okay. Um, this is a group of people who extend and improve life, delivers revolutionary cardiac performance solutions, and one day this group of people is going to look up at that clock and it's going to say number one. Exactly. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you very much.